present for 15 minutes only on youth developments and emerging security challenges in Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Amina. Uh, once more again, let me add my voice to uh, Godwin, Fumi, and all of the energetic organizers of this uh, conference. As I told Godwin, if Godwin uh, Fumi and ALC calls, you must answer. Um, uh, so let me uh, segue into the paper very quickly. Uh, this paper, as you've seen from the abstract, examines the extent to which uh, the contemporary or the current generation of young people in West Africa, unlike their predecessors, could successfully transition to adulthood and contribute to positive regional transformation without becoming part of the forces of insecurity, violence, and stability. The agency of young people and the choices that they make are undoubt undoubtedly crucial elements in this successful transition, uh, as well as the extent to which uh, they would be able to contribute uh, to national and regional development. The key to the prevention of the occurrence of widespread violence and security in West Africa, however, lay not only in the choices that young people make, but the extent to which national as well as sub-regional organizations like ECOWAS as well as lo local communities could harness the positive aspects of some of the larger structural forces uh, that are playing out in West Africa. By these larger structural forces, I mean rapid uh, population transformation, the massive global economic changes that are going on, especially the cycle of uh, uh, commodity and mineral boom, of which China is a part of, um, the high technology communications uh, uh, shift that's going on and which uh, young people are part of, transnational migrations, as well as the rapid growing uh, urbanization of which youth, youth are a major part. Uh, in harnessing these uh, forces of change that I just met, these structural forces of change that I just mentioned, ECOWAS, various governments must move beyond uh, what really now seems to be ineffectual vision statements and strategies. They must muster the requisite political will and take the necessary action to craft serious de developmental projects. Uh, projects that will provide uh, secure environments in which young people and the rest of uh, West Africa's population can live dignified, productive, and creative uh, lives. In thinking about and conceptualizing youth, uh, there are a number of things that I want to throw out. Uh, first, uh, youth have always been part of the social structure uh, of uh, West. I've always been part of the social structure uh, of uh, West Africa. Uh, but trying to develop a meaningful portrait of young people at a given moment in time in West Africa uh, is a very difficult, uh, it's a very challenging process uh, because uh, just as we're trying to delineate or think about uh, their structural position in society, young people are like a moving target. Uh, you think you have a snapshot, you think you have a picture of a particular youth demography, and four, five, or six years later, you realize that uh, new groups of people have moved into youthhood and uh, uh, large groups of people have moved out of youthhood. youthhood. Um, second, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges about studying youth, uh, especially in uh, Africa as a whole, uh, is that the data that we're using uh, is incomplete and in some cases outmoded. One of the huge struggles that I have about this paper is most of the, the data that exists uh, uh, data that talk about youth uh, uh, in the mid-first decade of the uh, 21st century, 2006-2007. Uh, Most of those people that are in that particular data are no longer youth, uh, uh, regardless of uh, the definition. Uh, second uh, is, of course, uh, we are all aware that there's a discrepancy or disharmony between international and national definitions of youth. 
Uh, the United Nations used, used this the 15 to 24 years range, whilst in West Africa, you have a broad variation uh, that starts at the lower end from uh, 15 at the upper end uh, 40. Yes, uh, the Republic of Guinea uh, actually conceives youth as being between 50 and uh, 40 years uh, old. Uh, uh, in, in time, uh, added to that is harmony, uh, the, the extensive debate uh, which over the two decades in which youth have become a major field uh, in um, uh, the, a, major, a major field of study in Africa is you've had a lot of debate about the character and experiences uh, of youth in the literature. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, the nature of that debate. I want to reiterate what I thought uh, was a good position that the UVEX report arrived at, which was the focus on youthhood rather than youth. Uh, uh, also, uh, this was a report that points out uh, uh, I think with great merit that youth is a varying uh, social construct and uh, a social rank that's tied to patterns of entitlement, status, and social advantages within families, workplace, and large uh, within the larger society. I think that's a good uh, sociological definition to begin uh, to work with. Uh, it was a definition that also took into consideration uh, the fact that uh, youthhood is defined not only by age, but gender, class, ethnicity, occupation, self-perception, and also residence. What I want to add to that um, uh, in this particular paper is youth as a historical subject as well as a political subject. In thinking about youth uh, in West Africa and the rest of Africa, we have to think of youth over uh, uh, time. The context within which youth emerge, uh, the relationships, uh, the conditions under which youth or youthhood is created, uh, the relationships that exist um, uh, within different populations insofar as youth is concerned, not only among communities and uh, the larger society, but the relationship that exists between young people and uh, the state. And it's in that particular last uh, set of relationship, youth as a particular, as a political uh, subject, self-conscious political subject that I am um, uh, particularly uh, interested in. As I said, youth have a long history uh, in Africa, especially uh, West Africa. Uh, but I want to sort of put youth into historical perspective uh, in a number of ways. First, within the colonial uh, um, uh, context, clearly European contact with and subsequent colonization of Africa unleashed new forces, new ideas, new relationships structures and uh, experiences that reshape the experience of uh, young people in West Africa in a number of ways. First, uh, colonialism drew, drew in young people as various forms of labor uh, within local colonial economies and within the global capitalist uh, economy. Young people were part of the fighting forces that, con that Europeans used to conquer uh, African societies. They were also part of uh, the forces that resisted uh, colonialism. Uh, young people provided the labor that helped build the infrastructure, the material infrastructure of uh, co uh, colonialism. Uh, colonialism also exposed young people to new religious forms, Christianity being the most important and new educational forms of which Western education uh, was uh, equally important. Uh, this introduced young people, uh, offered young people new career, but also much more important uh, new leadership opportunity. Colonialism also facilitated the uh, uh, urbanization of Africa. Uh, the consequences of all of this colonial development was that, uh, especially urbanization, uh, was that uh, it enabled youth to begin to forge new identities. And it also enabled young people in various West African countries uh, to begin to differentiate their experiences, uh, especially one based on special residence. We begin to see much more clear differentiation between the experiences of young people living in cities and young people living in the rural uh, context. But perhaps one of the most crucial consequences of colonialism insofar as the emergence of youth as a political subject is concerned was the role of young people in the nationalist 
labor and anti-colonial movements that developed, especially in the post-Second World War period, to challenge uh, colonialism. Young people contributed uh, into the national ideologies. I'm not going to go into detail about uh, the various uh, political parties and movements, but the Viganda boys were crucial in Nkoma's strategy of mobilizing for independence uh, in uh, Ghana. Uh, so young people were part of the politicization, the mobilization uh, of Af West Africans uh, for inde independence. Uh, these young nationalists also became part of the government that led Africa to independence. So what happened? Um, how did that government behave and how did they respond uh, to uh, the youth uh, uh, question? How did some of these radical people who celebrated, who talked about young Africa think about or responded uh, to youth? One of the discussion that we are having this morning uh, was about the process of depoliticization that uh, uh, followed uh, independence. Uh, that despite the efforts that governments made uh, to respond to, to choose different developmental paths, uh, was that youth, especially youth as political subject, is seeded in the post-colonial agenda of most uh, West African governments, where youth uh, uh, were important, they were uh, embedded in education or other ministries or agencies uh, dealing with youth as uh, development objects. Uh, the youth, youth were also, youth, youth also, colonial governments also dealt with and responded uh, to other forms of youth. Uh, uh, one form of youth that colonial governments Post-colonial governments, West African governments, like colonial governments, were interested in and in which security agents pay a lot of attention to were the so-called juvenile and criminal youth, especially those youth in the city. Youth did continue to uh, exist as political uh, subjects, as in fact the political landscape changed. Uh, is that young people, especially uh, uh, marginalized and excluded people in the cities uh, and people in rural areas, became a reservoir for politicians to mobilize and use uh, essentially as hired thugs uh, during the um, uh, election during elections uh, period. But youth politics, youth engagement with the state would change radically in the 1990s, late 1980s and 1990s. Why? Uh, I posit there are three major reasons why there was a shift uh, in youth activism and politics. The first is demographic. Uh, by the 1970s and 1980s, there was an expansion in the youth population. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, what we begin to see is the first evidence of uh, one of the phenomena which is much discussed in the literature now, the emergence of the youth bulge uh, in, um, Afri in Africa generally, but West Africa uh, specifically. The emergence of this population with a large demand for social services, especially education, health, and employment posed a formidable challenge to governments. And that challenge came at the precise point at which African states, especially West African states, were going through major economic and political structural crisis. Um, uh, that crisis was evident uh, uh, in declining economic performances uh, that came from uh, declining commodity prices, uh, uh, that was exacerbated by the oil shocks of the mid 1970s. Uh, uh, that was evident in declining GDPs, but also budget uh, problems. Uh, it was also evident in sort of uh, the development of uh, an extensive rent-seeking uh, economy by the political elite. Uh, so the behavior of the political elite compounded rather than uh, uh, help uh, assuage the structural crisis. With very few exceptions, West African rulers 
and political elites, despite their proclamation on forging national unity and promoting development, became much more factional, ethnic-based, authoritarian, corrupt, and engaged in frequent violent competition for power. At a precise moment in post-colonial African history where we needed imaginative, forward-looking, and energetic leadership, that's at the point where we began to produce probably the worst forms of leadership uh, around the continent generally, but in West Africa specifically. Uh, uh, in the larger table, I hope to show, in the larger paper, I hope to show tables about uh, the, the range of uh, coups, coup d'etat, polit political instability that characterize uh, that particular period. Uh, there mu there's much debate about how youth disaffection coming out of uh, the structural crisis translated into political activism and pushed them into uh, violence. I'm not, again, going to go into detail about that particular debate uh, in this particular presentation, but I want to point out four different features of um, uh, youth activism that stood out. First, uh, young people in West Africa and different parts of Africa uh, develop very deep feelings of social injustice and alienation from the state. Uh, drawing from local as well as international discursive sources and network, young people began to construct grievance narratives that condemned uh, existing social conditions, the behavior of the elite, and called for radical change. Second, these feelings and attitudes uh, were definitely part of visible, rebellious, and confrontational youth culture that began to develop in different parts of Africa, in Nigeria, in parts of Ghana, but more so in Sierra Leone and Liberia, which are studied extensively. You can see elements of that, that rebellious culture in youth music, in youth fashion, and uh, youth uh, behavior. Third, uh, uh, which is crucial, was the decision that was made uh, by various segments of young people, uh, male and subsequently female, urban and rural, educated as well as illiterate, to become involved in various violent political projects that first give them political visibility, give them sense of empowerment, and also promise to change local, national, and in some cases, clearly was evident in the case of Liberia and Sierra Leone, the regional political landscape for the better. Um, the was in Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and the uh, violent conflicts in Niger Delta, which uh, involved the extensive participation of young people, showed some of the key features of the, this youth challenge. Uh, then in the 1990s and at the turn of the millennium, it would take a diverse cast of local, national, and regional, uh, as well as international actors to end these uh, conflicts uh, by the end of the first decade of the 21st uh, uh, century. Young people uh, were also deeply involved in the movements to end uh, the conflicts. They played very important role, especially in civil, religious, and non-governmental organizations to support the various peace efforts. In that particular process of also ending conflict, young people were usually the strongest purveyors of the mainly liberal democratic discourses uh, and ideas that underpin this process. Uh, uh, as a consequence, some of these young people, especially educated youth, uh, provided alternate forms of leadership to those who were engaged uh, in war. Huh? Okay, so let me, five minutes, quickly. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but youth involvement in the violent contestations of state legitimacy as well as their participation in the constructive uh, uh, peace building processes are a number of key positive key features for West Africa. First, the dialogic 
an inextricable connection between security and development in transforming environments became evident to national governments and the various national and international, regional and international organizations involved in the peace process. Second, though West African political systems still fall within the continuum of the transition from authoritarian to democratic governance, with Ghana probably at the far end and places like Guinea-Bissau uh, at the other end, the days of the long reigning dictators or heads of state, uh, except Jame and uh, Kampare, are clearly receding in the region. Uh, we can sort of see a normative shift in terms of uh, what West Africans are willing to tolerate. Uh, third, uh, the, the, these processes helped ECOWAS to refocus its vision and its concerns. Uh, uh, not solely focused on economic integration, but ECOWAS paid a lot of attention not only to security, but also demographic uh, governance. Our fourth and uh, most important uh, young people and the issues affecting them, especially education, employment, and health, uh, goes to the forefront of uh, the agenda, both official and intellectual agenda, as this presentation uh, points out. Uh, let me try to round up very quickly in terms of highlighting a number of key features in terms of where young people are. So on one hand, the news for West Africa, according to uh, the Lords of the Global Economy, says all of the indicators are good. The economy is booming. West African uh, countries are among the economies that are doing very well, that over the last 10 plus years, the economies have grown at an average of about 5% uh, percent among some of the highest growth rate uh, in the world. Uh, there's definitely sort of a boom in uh, commodity production and the extraction of mineral resources uh, in the region. China's relationship with uh, Africa emblematizes this. Uh, China's trade with Africa has increased a hundredfold, uh, more than a hundredfold in the last uh, 20 uh, years. So if the picture is good, what's the problem? Well, the problem is we have those positive changes, but it doesn't seem as if there's been major move in the structural problems and sorts of challenges that we face. Uh, population still continues uh, uh, to rise in West Africa. We have some of the highest population of fertility and growth rates uh, in the region. A second cycle of young people are now becoming of uh, age. Uh, uh, second, the incidences of structural poverty remains very high in West Africa. And what's happening and part of the consequences of the boom is that there are people who are doing very well and there are a lot of people who are not doing very well. So that one of the things that's actually happening uh, is that the contradictions between those who have a lot uh, who are benefiting from the boom and those who are not profiting from the boom uh, is very much um, uh, evident. So the structural, the structural situation uh, um, is still very much similar. So uh, in rounding up, what is the prognosis uh, in terms of where young people uh, and the kind of challenge or security challenge they constitute uh, to West Africa. I think the picture is fairly balanced because uh, the post-conflict situation has created opportunity for meaningful uh, participation of young people in economic, political, and social processes. The UVEC study points out uh, to that. Uh, on the other hand, these opportunities are opening up, uh, or these opportunities, uh, even for excluded and marginalized groups who are forming finding new ways of creating forms of security uh, uh, for themselves and finding ways to transition to adulthood outside the formal uh, system, you have a lot of problems. They're happening under conditions of serious contestation uh, between young people uh, and the uh, state. Uh, and I'll end up with, with a couple of things uh, to watch within that uh, broader uh, context in terms of where to look for youth uh, challenge. So youth challenge is still, our uh, youth security challenge is still in the conditions that still continue to exist. Youth challenge 
uh, still exist uh, under the, 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 the character and the situation of young people in the region and the conditions under which uh, they live their uh, lives. Uh, we still have narratives of grievances that come from this particular condition. What we do not have, and this is very significant, and this might be uh, uh, part of the opening of the land uh, scape, we do not have this current narrative of grievances developing extensively, except perhaps in the case of Nigeria, in the case of Akim, in the case of Nigeria in terms of Boko Haram, and in continual low intensive conflicts uh, in different parts of uh, the region. Do we see organized, uh, do we see organizations which are drawing youth into radical projects once more, as I said, once more, uh, except Boko Haram, on which the picture in terms of youth involvement, it's not very clear. We don't see uh, in, at a very visible level uh, uh, those organizations uh, in West Africa. On the last note, uh, but there's a point that I want to sort of raise in terms of security concern. Uh, and this speaks more to Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, the recruitment processes of young people into security agency, even with the existing standards, even with the existing changes, have not changed very radically. It's very much politicized. Some of the youth that are being drawn into those forces are not well educated. In the making of the crisis in the 1990s, it wasn't only youth that were in the rebel movement or in the anti-state movement that were sources of insecurity. It was also the young people who were in these uh, forces, as shown by uh, the participation of NPRC as well as the AFRC soldiers in Sierra Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I Thank you. We won't take discussion. Let me invite uh, Wale to come and make his presentation. 15 minutes. I won't subtract on the council, Ismail, but I'm asking to be brief. That would be ages. Thank you. We'll shorten tea break instead. Sorry, I'm a bit short. <laughs> um, thank you for the organizers. Thanks to ALC. Thanks to everybody in the room. And obviously, thanks to Professor Ismail. Um, I still wonder, I think we are family from somewhere. <laughs> because he's traced his route to Central Lagos. And I'm from Central Lagos. So we have to dig up. Yes, thank you. Um, like the previous speaker, or the last speaker, uh, we are both together on the UVEX project. And as much as his own presentation uh, borrows likely from the UVEX experience, mine will also follow the same pattern. Um, my presentation, my paper, is something, and I, a paper I've put together with Dr. Fumi. Uh, after not just our work on the UVEX project, but also the follow-up project on militancy and violence in West Africa. Uh, I will take off from where the last speaker ended. Uh, but my point of departure is that, contrary to expectations or what is written in a lot of Western and perhaps media report on Africa, and in Africa as well, there is good news. And that part of that good news is that even from the 1990s, even with the level of political volatility and armed conflict in the 1990s, statistically, only few youth in West Africa were involved in armed conflict or were members of armed groups. Most youth still embrace less violent or non-violent choices and alternatives in the context of marginality, vulnerability, and exclusion. What my presentation does do is to provide a much more overarching, robust overview, picture of what is it that young people 
do? What kind of choices, what kind of activities the young people embrace uh, to cope with social, economic, and political vulnerability and exclusion? Uh, I'm going to start with four examples. Pardon me if those examples are heavily Nigerian or Nigerianized. And a few people in the room will be quite conversant with some of these examples. The first one, in about, I think in 2004, one of Nigeria's hip hop artists, he did a very fairly popular album or, or track, uh, which he called Nigeria Jaga Jaga, which means Nigeria is broken. Jaga Jaga means in pieces. And this album drew the hunger of the former president of Basanjo that when he was asked about it on national TV, he openly caused the parenthood of this young artist that we see to say that Nigeria is broken. And he banned the playing of that music on all national and even private media in Nigeria. The second example, or second anecdote, uh, I'm sure every, almost everybody in this room received one business proposal or email or the other at some point in the last 10 years about money to be transferred, about some very nice looking business proposals. It was on this basis that when Colin Powell was the Secretary of State in the United States, he wrote a memo that, that was leaked where he was saying Nigeria, Nigerians are scammers. Nigeria is a country of scammers. He openly said that. I think that memo was some, sometimes around 2006 or thereabout. Fast forward some three or four years down the line, at a particular function by this day newspaper in Nigeria, <clears throat> Colin Powell was there as a special guest. And guess what? He was dancing to the music on Yahuze. And he was dancing and he was being taught how to dance Yahuze. Yahuze, Yahuze. And what is Yahuze? Yahuze is a song about internet scam in Nigeria. And Colin Powell was dancing to the music. The third example was that one of the leaders of Subnational ethnic militias called OPC, Odua People's Congress, Ghani Adams, suddenly became a peace celebrity in Nigeria. He was made <clears throat> a peace envoy, a, a, a peace ambassador in Nigeria years after he led the OPC to commit massive killings in Lagos and the Southwest. The fourth example was that in 2010, major leaders of some of the armed groups in the Niger Delta, Tom Polus of this world, Asari Dukugos of this world, Tom Mateke of this world, they were not only visited in their camps by the then vice president and now president of Nigeria, but they were actually conveyed to Abuja in a presidential jet. And not just only that, they were giving, now, I mean, in the last few years, they've been giving series of security contracts running into several millions of dollars. So what does this for anecdote, what does it tell us? They tell us interesting stories, but interesting realities. And that reality is that marginality or marginalization of young people in West Africa. It's not a permanent state of affairs. And to what I, this, the, the second implication is that what is marginal is not necessarily what is outside of the official, especially where the centeredness is no longer in the official dome. The epicenter of society, when and where it moves, it moves to the informal sphere, where the info, where informality defines formality. Then you begin to question what exactly is marginality. 
So marginality is less of being outside of official sphere. Marginality in West Africa is defined by other things, which I'll get to in a few minutes. But the anecdotes that I've given, they may seem to be things that are highly visible, highly political, things happening or transformation taking place at strategic levels. The reality, at least from the project with the research we did at King's College, is that patterns of this transformation is replicated at different layers, at different levels, both rural, urban, across West Africa. Overall, this anecdote, they signpost the centrality of youth in the widening scope of unofficial and unrecorded channels of socioeconomic and political governance. Through a series of insertion, co-optation, and challenges to the school, to the status quo, youth in West Africa are readily exercising unparalleled influence on former and state-led processes from their below position. More significant is that some of these examples, they indicate a major departure from Afro-youth pessimism that appears to dominate the majority of Western media and research writing on young people in Africa. Some of these challenge, some of the rubbish things that have been written about young people in West Africa in important ways, right from Robert Kaplan's coming anarchy, all through to what you had with Paul Collier and his rubbish grievance and grievance, and a few other ones that have, that have been written. Indeed, youth and youth issues have gained traction in Africa's security problematic owing to governance deficit, socioeconomic decline, and the reality of a youth bulge. However, much of the extant discourse have directly or indirectly reinforced a youth at risk as opposed to a youth at risk approaches, and also paint youth in West Africa as problem as opposed to youth and youth bulge being opportunities as well as solutions to the socioeconomic challenges West African countries face. And this also underlines the strong emphasis on marginality or marginal youth as, as it relates to violence and armed conflict, especially in the Manu River countries in the 1990s. And less attention has been paid to the transformation of youth marginal situations or conditions. This youth uh, as problem approaches have often mutated into unintended labeling or labels that carry unspoken but important assumptions. Moreover, the prospect of transforming marginality and vulnerability is either totally foreclosed or completely overlooked due to the faulty methodological approaches and lenses from which youth in West Africa are researched. This paper challenges some of these assumptions or indeed the youth as problem assumption in significant ways. First <clears throat> is that youth in first is that the focus on youth trajectories, if we focus on youth trajectories and trying to understand their exercise of agency, actually multiple agencies, they help us to underline the logicality and the possibility of transforming and overcoming vulnerability. Social exclusion and marginalization are dynamic processes that, occur, that occur over time and which can be reversed and which are being reversed daily by youth in West Africa. Secondly, marginality in West Africa is fundamentally about survival as opposed to social mobility. Marginality appears to have mutated into the absence of sufficient unofficial processes, institutions and resources, especially social networking comprising family peers, local and diaspora community we, all of which act as sources of support for young people. Accordingly, marginality in West Africa is hardly about young people being disconnected from formal state-led processes and institutions of learning, support, and control. Indeed, the reality suggests that marginality is about the scarcity of unofficial extra-state sources of survival and support. Unlike Latin America and other uh, developing regions of the world, Marginality in West Africa is really about social disorganization or isolation from 
surrounding urban life. It is hardly about inappropriate rural ideas in urban context or self perpetuating cycles of cynicism and poverty. It is hardly about para, you know, paratic, uh, parasitic behavior of voluntary unproductivity or political apathy. The notion of marginality in West Africa departs away from official dom. And our argument in this paper is that a marginal location on the formal plane or formal spectrum is hardly the same with marginal positions in the informal sphere, meaning that young people who are marginal in formal sphere can actually be mainstream in the informal sphere. So this tells us where actually is the mainstream in West Africa? Is it in officialdom or is it in unofficial processes? Similarly, little attempt has been made to explain and explore the transition from marginality to empowerment. How does this happen, if it happens? What are the enablers? Under what conditions? And which kind of or typologies of youth are able to achieve this transformation from marginality to empowerment? It is an argument in this paper that youth, through globalization and informatics, they exercise huge influence, increasingly serving as gatekeepers in informal channels of socioeconomic organization and production. The informal arena in West Africa is increasingly the epicenter of power, the epicenter of innovation, the epicenter of empowerment, and the epicenter where public uh, and former state institution agendas are being set. Youth in West Africa continue to be active agents, of course, within the constraints of societal structures at local and global levels, in the social, economic, and political transformations of their societies. Indeed, they are first imagined as drivers and gatekeepers of social change through the appropriation and misappropriation of local and global private and public, official and unofficial resources. Youth continue to instigate as much as occupy spaces vacated by the state formal institution. Through this, youth are redefining the boundaries of state powers and intervention. They are also redefining the unofficial scope of citizenship rights and obligations. And they are also redefining the undercurrents of state society relations and the boundaries and mechanics of the private and public sphere. Despite the reality of this in relation to youth in general, it is important to note that the trajectories of male and female transformation of marginality differ considerably in a way that the transformation of male youth are more robust, quicker, cross-sectoral, and more sustainable than those of their female counterparts. These differentials along gender underline the structural constraints and opportunities offered by the dynamics of intergenerational as much as gender relation, as well as religious and cultural practices and intergroup dynamics. Why is it so that the transformation of male and female youth differ? They differ because the nature and intensities of vulnerability differ across different categories of youth, especially male and female categories. So do the pathway resources and processes of their transformation and their transitioning from marginality to empowerment. Also, the resources, trajectories, and processes of male youth trans transitioning are much more resourced than those of their female counterparts. Indeed, this does not deny that female youth also achieve transformation. What this is drawing attention to is the relative uh, more difficulty and challenges that female youth face in trying to transform their marginal situation. Uh, why, why have we focused on youth and the gender dimension? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't go or try to justify that, but I, because the, I think the last speaker has done justice to that. But it is quite important to say that the focus on youth and the gender dimension in the interface of marginality 
and the trans and its transition into mainstream underscores the youth underscores the reality of youth as the <coughs> context where transition to full citizenship occurs or is expected to occur, and the phase where gender roles are formed, imposed, imbibed, and reproduced. Youth is a site for understanding processes of social change and a powerful force of social change. What is the context in which this marginality, the, the transitioning of this marginality takes place? I think, again, the last uh, presenter has you know, spoken or alluded to this in great light. But it's just important for me to just footnote this, that, of course, you have the economic uh, context uh, right from the 19, late 1970s into the 80s and into the 90s, period synonymous with structural adjustment and the retreat, the retreat of the state, in which case the point of contact between the state and many young people became reduced. In fact, the, you know, the connectors between the state, former state processes and, young, and youth in West Africa became non-existent in a number of ways because the state could no longer provide critical social services like education, like health, and the rest. Politically, the context of armed conflict also reduced the capacity of the state to deliver or to function effectively. Socially, globalization has also meant that the reach of the state or the ability of the state to police or control within its borders is much more reduced. But more importantly, it has also fostered sociocultural changes in terms of values, norms, aspirations, and intergenerational relations. Cumulatively, all these realities, when added together, they point to shift, important shift in state-society relation. They also point to important shift in the public-private balance, especially in terms of power and responsibility between the public and the private, between the state and society. And finally, they also point to the reconfiguration of the roles, powers, and size of the state. It would be quite an interesting debate to see whether the state, in terms of its roles, its powers, and responsibility now, compared to 20, 25 years, or even in the 1960s, what has changed in that regard? In the context of UVEX, our survey in seven West African countries point to five critical activities that young people, five cluster of activities that young people uh, tend to resort to in trying to transform their marginal position. The first one is huge investment in talent industries. By talent industries, we mean the booming, the expansion and booming art, music, uh, home video, Nollywood, comedy and entertainment industry, reality shows, event management, sports, the mushrooming of soccer academies across West Africa. These are visible realities across West African cities and societies that you have, compared to 20 years ago, the, the, the level of engagement and intensity of young people participation in this activity is quite uh, stunning. And what is also very remarkable is that until now, many of these activities were taken as leisure activities, but now they have been transformed. They are no longer leisure activities, they are career pathways. They are sources of uh, livelihood. They are, you know, occupational now. And what, what are the things that will indicate the reality of this. If you look at uh, certain global uh, social entertainment platforms or outlets, uh, be it you know, your BSky VT uh, satellite TV station, MTV Africa, or, your, or MTV, all of these have created specialist channels for, for African artists, for African you know, musicians, for African comedians to showcase their talent. So this has fostered the integration of African art, African culture uh, into, uh, into the global arena. More importantly is that the investment and engagement of African youth in this talent industry has also led to the emergence of new role models. Uh, when I was in primary school in the early 80s, and I grew up in Nigeria, uh, sorry, I, you know, we used to run to cinema stay. My parents must never know. But we would save money and we'll go and watch films. Uh, 
Our favorite icons then were Bruce Lee, you know, after a while Jackie Chan. For those who follow the Chinese film, there were the ones we call Ewenge. Ewenge were the Chinese masters who had this white beard and, you know, all this. They were, they were called, you know, Ewenge. I mean, those were the icons in terms of, you know, the film industry. The favorite star talents of this world, the Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger of this world, Chuck Norris and the, you know, and the likes. But now, it is no longer those. Is your, is your Omotola? Is your uh, Genevieve? I, I mean, and the rest. And not just only that. The language, Oga, has become a global phenomenon. It is no longer a Nigerian expression any longer. So you see, you see this transformation in terms of, you know, our African values. African expressions have made it onto the global arena. So that's the first set of activities that we found many young people being engaged in. The second set of activities was that was a membership of militia groups, armed groups, gangs, and criminal networks. And I think the last week has you know, alluded to this. Here you have the men of this world in the Niger Delta, the OPC, as I've said, the RUF, and of course, your Boko Haram. Um, area boys, junctions, bases, servicemen, rariman them, uh, your Jew man, and political talks, and the variance of, of all of this. Young people, especially male, they have embraced some of these activities or this cluster of activities as a route for economic independence, as a route for engaging formal actors and institutions, as a route for, for influencing agendas in the former sphere, and also as platforms for achieving new social statuses. The third category or cluster of activities we found to be quite widespread among young people in West Africa was the formation and membership of self-help advocacy groups. And in this category, you have your NGOs, your CBOs, your CSOs, youth groups and associations. Young people have embraced this as avenue to give them voice, to give them visibility, to give them representation, to possibly influence agendas in former state processes, and also new forms of achieving social statuses and new identities. The fourth categories of activities that we found was informal, you know, a range of informal livelihood activities. And here you have trading, especially cross-border trading, as well as petty trading, uh, call centers, repairs of GSM, as well as the old IT. Uh, I mean, you go to almost every African city has its own computer village equivalent, where if you have problem with your mobile, you have to, you know, you go there, or you have problem with your laptop. Who are the people in this? Uh, computer villages. Who are the people you find there delivering or rendering services? You find you. And these are many young people who have never been to any apprenticeship on how to repair mobile phones or even computers. But in engaging with IT and the you know global revolution in informatics, they have learned the trade. Uh, a variant of this, uh, sorry, uh, then you have here, you know, here dressing and uh, barbering. And then you have Okada. And Okada is quite interesting here because I think of all the range of youth uh, pathways to transformation or transforming marginality, Okada is perhaps the most visible, the most strategic. Why is it the most visible and most strategic? It's because, one, it has provided an organizational platform for young people. Every city, you have Okada riders having their own association. And these associations are quite powerful and they have become part of civil society. Secondly is that Okada riders individually and collectively through their association, they are increasingly being courted by formal actors, especially politicians. So they represent a key constituent in politics. Third is that Okada itself is a signpost of youth identity. Similarly, the Okada business has emerged as a symbol of youth entrepreneurial triumph or achievement or entrepreneurship as a, you know, a sign of youth achievement. 
Also, Okada has become a key element in politics and ele uh, electioneering. It is not unusual to find politicians giving out Okada machines as part of uh, you know, election campaign or giving out election ailments as part of election campaign. So the, 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 the imagery of Okada and his, his accessories, they have become part of the political calculus. Also, Okada has become central to economic processes and production in West Africa in the light of rapid urbanization, in the, in the, in the light of you know, phenomenal growth in the informal sector across West Africa. Finally, Okada has become a social institution people have to deal with on a daily basis and people have to engage with. So Okada is quite strategic in that sense. The final set of activities that young people also embrace is religion and membership of new religious movement. And I think the last speaker also alluded to that. Here you have the rise of new Christian and Islamic movement, including the Boko Haram of this world, but also the redeem of this world, you know, the Pentecostal churches and the rest. And what is quite important about this new religious movement is that, one, they are redefining identities. They have become new layers of identity. It is not unusual for people to say, I'm a Christian before anything else, or I'm a Muslim before anything else. So they have become a new but important layer of identity formation. Secondly, they have become a basis for social mobilization. More often than not, it's becoming very quicker and easier to mobilize on the basis of religion and religious movement than on any other uh, social marker. Third is that they are, these religious movements they have become key providers of social services. Some of the space vacated by the state in the 1980s in the face of structural adjustment, many of these religious movements have moved into this by providing education. So many of them have established schools. They have established you know, uh, primary health care centers. Not that this is completely new, because if you are conversant with the history of, say, the Ahmadiyya movement, and even the Catholics and the rest, they've always done this. But what you see is that this new religious movement, they are taking, they have intensified these processes. Of course, there is a debate to be had, especially in the context of Nigeria, where many of these private schools established by these churches, especially churches, are not affordable to, to their members. But that's the debate to be had on another occasion. Also, these religious movements, they have become platforms for accessing formal actors and institutions. It is not unusual. I think one of the iconic uh, photos about Nigeria and Nigeria, the current Nigerian president is to see him kneeling down before uh, Baba Adibayo, uh, Adeboye, the redeemed, the head of the redeemed church, and he was being prayed for. And we also have the head of the Christian Association, Pastor Ayo Rishet Jafo, also praying and invoking Holy Spirit on the president. The president was born to uh, these religious uh, leaders. So they have become platform for accessing formal actors and institutions. It is not unusual for young people looking for jobs to target bank managers or even commissioners or governors through their churches, through their mosques. Similarly, these religious institutions, they are also defining state society relations in terms of acting as a meeting point where society and state now meet. Finally, they have become platforms for influencing agendas in the public sphere. So what are the key observations from these activities? In two minutes, I'll round up. The first is that male youth transformation is much more privileged, better resourced, more robust, and more encompassing, meaning that it cut across social, economic, political, and even cultural spheres. Female youth transformation, on the other hand, is more than likely to be protected more likely to take longer to, to happen, less robust, less resourced, and is leading with additional challenges that compromises or neutralizes the agency of, your, of female youth, as well as reduce the success rate. So what are the things that account for this difference between, or differences between male and female youth transformation of marginality? Uh, the, the, the underlining thing is what we call structural inequalities. But these structural inequalities manifest in four ways. First is through what we call social system conditioning, meaning how the social system in terms of the perspective on gender rules and gender activities, 
socializes female youth into economically dependent roles as wives and mothers. Similarly, it also socializes female youth to play less visible background roles when it comes to public governance. It also pre-structures occupational roles and choices and opportunities for, for females. That is why you don't see too many women or female youth riding Okada. Finally, it also conditions youth markers for females, meaning that in terms of identity, meaning that a married female youth stops being a youth the moment she gets married and becomes the wife of somebody, not minding the fact that the husband will still be a youth. The, the second way in which these structural inequalities play out or manifest is in the patterns of gender relations and unequal access to power, resources, and opportunities, both in the formal and informal sphere in relation to the opportunities for females. And it also reflected in terms of the values and norms of power and politics linked to patriarchy, how it is male-dominated and serves the, the agendas of men. <laughs> of removing a particular individual who is a dictator was achieved. Everybody went to sleep. In the, it is in this context that governance in West Africa is yet to be deepened to such an extent to reflect or respond to the needs of the whole population, especially the female component of the population. Moreover, even where females are in power or they are represented in government, uh, in, in West Africa you have Liberia where you have a female president. But this does not mean much because the foundational structure culture and norms of power are still heavily patriarchal. Finally, these structural inequalities also manifest itself in terms of institutional practices. These are the institutional rules that are embedded in socioeconomic, cultural, and political institutions in both public and private sphere. And these institutional practices, they reflect society practices, in, the, in this case, patriarchy, uh, and instances of this is in terms of property rights and inheritance rights, where even in countries, quite in a number of countries now, laws have been changed to allow for, for, you know, for women or female youth to, to inherit. But the reality is, in terms of the actual practices in, in society or in the informal sphere, that is not enforceable. Uh, similarly, what you also have those institutional practices. Example, another example is in, in terms of gender-based occupational roles, where you go to offices and you find females or female youth as secretaries, or in the lower cadre as support staff, or in, in Nigeria and, and I think across West Africa now, many of the banking uh, establishments they purposely reserved their marketing jobs for females. This, in a way, also reflects those societal uh, institutional practices. Finally, what does this mean? This means that female youth, they face a double whammy. The first one being that they are youth, and the second one being that they are females. And in this, uh, we have manifestations of what Young has called five phases of oppression, including marginalization, powerlessness, violence, and exploitation. What this presentation hopes to do is to draw attention to some of the structural limitations that limit or prevent or hinder female youth transformation from their marginal position. Thank you. Thank you, um, Wale, Ismail, and Rashid. Uh, let's take 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Is there a roving mic? Or? This, oh, sorry, discussant. Five minutes and then 10 for discussion. Please. That's in shot. That's all right. Actually, I'm kind of relieved you said five minutes because these were such rich presentations. And I didn't get the papers before, so I've been scribbling madly. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be really brief, just to highlight certain things. And again, I just want to appreciate those were such rich um, presentations. And especially because for me, um, listening to it from the West African point of uh, perspective, we were talking about this at lunchtime with Bubaka, of how sometimes 
it is good to go outside the sphere that you're working in and hear it being echoed there. And I want to tie that into the thing we're talking about this morning and creating those spaces of conversation. And at the moment, I am in a number of um, spaces of conversation within East Africa. So I really appreciated um, the regional approach, um, Wale, that you took us to and asking what does that mean? But then also the very specific <coughs> reference also to countries, to states. Like Eka said before, it's got to be a both and approach because I'm also working in conversations in Kenya. Um, so just very quickly, some of the things that really struck me, um, and I want to put this in a context, a couple of years ago, just quickly, we, we did a project on scenarios where we actually got young Kenyans to, to, to go through a process of looking at everything from the history. So Ismail, I really appreciated that emphasis on um, youth, the youth bulge doesn't just occur. We didn't just wake up one morning and it was there. But there's been a history to it with particular implications and then bringing them to imagine the future. And it was interesting for me how much we didn't think there would be so much of what I now understand as a security agenda to it and how negative the, the peers, so-called, the head of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, for example, was very negative to what they came up with. But listening to what you had, I thought one of the things that would have been great to do is if we'd taken the same presentation and said, this is Nigerian and here are lessons we can learn, they probably would have embraced it. But because we were saying, this is happening where we are seeing it, it was very difficult for them to take. I really appreciated, um, therefore, just coming out of those conversations, making that conversation much more complex and remembering we're always dealing with youth at risk, youth who are themselves at um, the risk itself and youth who are mediating. And, and I began to think as both of you spoke um, that part of the discourse, part of what happens needs to happen in those spaces that Fumi was talking about this morning is to allow people to see these as alternatives. I think often we look at youth and we only see one path that they can go to. And then we feel like we have to stop the youth, you know? The youth can't make decisions, they can't take action, they can't be part of these discussions. But just offering that up. And I really appreciated um, the, the, the spaces. Um, okay, let me start uh, first with Ismail. But when you, 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 when you made um, several references, actually, I think I'll just put them together. The liminal space, that being at risk can also be quickly turned into a space of opportunity. And that space of marginality or liminality is actually a space where opportunities abound. And I think both of you really made me to start to think about that transformation, just that space of transformation that um, those spaces allowed us to see. Um, Ismail, I really enjoyed, like I said, that, that the, the way you put us in a context, um, both a regional context, but then also a continental context, and then reminding us that we come out of a history. I had never thought about, for example, in the colonial times, the, the people who are part of the security institutions, we're talking about this morning how security in itself, the way we think of those institutions, are a colonial structure. But those were young people, those were youth. And I, I, think, of, I think I've been thinking a lot more about what happens to female bodies in the space of the army or the police, but not asking what happens to young bodies or young minds when they're brought in, and that becomes the way that they are socialized. Um, and then the three levels that you, you talked about, what structures, what context, what supports them, and, and how can we make that a space? I don't want to even say where we suggest or influence um, policy, but where we can create the spaces where people who are in those conversations are aware of all those uh, multiple dimensions. I kept thinking, um, while as you were speaking, of these African folk tales, where often you have, say, an ogre or something coming in, and people try all the different solutions, and usually it's a girl child who is seen as a solution, and she comes up with something very creative where nobody else, you know, tie, you know, get the ogre to sleep by singing to them, giving them a big meal, and then plating his hair using strong grass to hold him down while people can come and destroy him. And I think that space of marginality, that space of liminality, is something that I also, I just really began to think about. Um, and then going back to the conversations in the morning is also to ask again, um, the question Fumi also asked, what makes you insecure? What makes different the range of youth insecure? And as we've talked so much about gender, I also want to bring in all the other aspects of, of um, difference and how when we start to talk about inter intersectionality 
I was thinking of a girl recently in Garissa who exploited that position, investment in the talent industries, and led her, her she's, she's, she's head of the debating association, and then they had a fashion show in a boys' school. She won. When she went back to school in the evening, she was also a prefect. She was called out of her dorm on the pretext that somebody was sick and was so badly beaten up by her fellow girls that she had to be, she's actually been withdrawn from the school. So that space of what makes people more vulnerable or less vulnerable, and then how our spaces of conversation can actually open up the spaces of choice. I think that the one thing that I kept thinking in my mind as I was listening to, to you guys was the choices that we have, the alternatives are so many, but they're choices that can lead us to different futures, they're choices that can determine the paths that we take to those futures, the choices that enable us to look at the different resources, the different um, support structures, the different enablers, facilitators, gatekeepers, um, even as we start to talk about those five activities. And I think if we had that honest conversation, then maybe we could also open up to more than five activities of creativity. I have so many other notes, but I am going to respect the five minutes. Thank you. Open for discussion. Thank you, Mishai. That was wonderful. Enlivening the discussion. Because yeah. <laughs> I can see people doing the afternoon shift. Everyone stand up and jump around. Yes. Should people come here or do we send them a mic? It's a mic. Uh -huh. Okay. Over here on the right, please. Thank you very much, uh, Is it? Thank you very much, uh, Amina, and thanks to the presenters. It was really, wow, encouraging to listen. But I was asking myself a question. Why didn't we put this topic as we did on the gender one that we on the last day? In, in bracket and security. Because my view is when listening to Wale, I think he brought that into the debate because he looked at the insecurity part, but also youth as part of the transformative agenda. And I think I would propose that maybe we look at it that way so that it's not narrowly focusing on youth as a problem. Mm -hmm. Because more often, we always problematize young people as though they are not part of the solution. And it reminded me of some of the um, old slogans during our time when we argued that not about us, but with us. So if you look at young people as part of the security in the continent, it might help us to also look at what are the spaces that young people can transform, particularly in the security sector. Because it is them that are made child soldiers. It is them that in the pre-1994 in South Africa were part of the self-defense unit. And they've been at the cold face. But when we then formalize those security institutions and governance elements, we see them as a problem. So I just, I'm not sure whether you can be able to put that in your papers as you uh, develop them further. But it also raised a question for me that even when we deal about, we, we talk about state and youth and security, are we willing to accept the energy that youth bring. Because they are not as, uh, well, the pace of transformation, uh, in my mind, sometimes it's slow in their view. They may want certain radical positions to be taken. And the question is, are governments, are, is society also willing to allow those radical positions? It was also interesting for me, and I'm not sure whether it could be done in the future, maybe not now, to also do a comparative study on this subject, maybe looking, we're looking at West Africa. It would be interesting to look at the Maghreb. It would be interesting to look at East and Southern Africa, whether we've got the same challenge. And I don't think it's too far off. I mean, if you look at the use of technology, particularly in the Maghreb, how the Tahrir Square was organized through cell phone and quickly, but you saw immediately when they were faced with 
you know, your formalization of the processes, that while technology is a good tool for mobilization, but without organization, the Muslim Brotherhood emerged and took over the election. So all those people who were in Tahrir Square somehow found themselves without a voice. So it would be quite interesting also to look at that dimension. And I think the Maghreb uh, story, particularly as it relates to youth, in my view, would be quite interesting. Maybe, as I say, not for now, but um, for the future. I also thought it would be interesting in that comparative study to also look what this bulge brings this youth bulge that we're talking about. We spoke of the Maghreb and the spring, which I don't believe was a spring. You look at South Africa today, when the youth led by Malima, the Youth League, mobilizing youth generally on issues of land and unemployment, marching from Joburg to Pretoria, everybody thought, ah, this won't happen. And it did happen. The AMCO strike in the mining sector one thing that the unions missed, and I would say even the political parties, the majority of them missed, was the youth nature of the mining workers in South Africa today. And that's why Malim was able to mobilize within that constituency and get the million votes that has made him to go into parliament. So there are some of the interesting uh, observations I think the two speakers that have made in their papers, which would be very interesting to look as we contend with this youthful um, society in our continent in particular. But also the question I had in my mind as we try to grapple with the question of a youthful Africa, how are we enabling young people to see themselves as a beneficiary of the future of this continent and therefore not wait in their engagement as Wale was saying some of the processes that are being engaged in West Africa so that they determine that future today. And what then becomes the role of the adult generation in creating space but also mentoring. Thank you. So we'll just take... Uh, Three comments, uh, questions, uh, and then some <coughs> panelists to respond. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to declare uh, that this subject is uh, of critical importance to me uh, because I'm a product of some affirmative action in Uganda where, in terms of policy, it was constitutionalized and the young people, the youth of, uh, of Uganda, have clearly set aside uh, offices. For instance, members of parliament, you've got the youth being represented in the parliament and in all decision-making levels, and also ring facing aspects of such affirmative action to the female gender. So that is how I started my politics. I was representing my first entry to uh, politics was representing the young people through affirmative action. So I, I really find it something critically of importance to all of us. Now, but um, I just want us to also look at the whole question of the youth, the youth being used to pursue other people's agendas other than their own agenda. Because when you go to political parties, the youth win basically mobilizers. During election time, they are seen, they are given resources, they are given logistics to mobilize for the party, not to mobilize for themselves. So how do we really factor this to get, to empower the youth to put more emphasis on pursuing agendas that have the effect of adding value to their generation? I, I think we really need to, to give that uh, Good thought. Then also the transitional nature of youthhood, because some of the policy directions we have look at youth as if they are like 
the gender issue. Because, I mean, when you're a woman, you're a woman. And there are those stereotypes that will be with you, whether you are young, whether you are old, they will always be with you. But there are stereotypes that a youth can outgrow if they're empowered. So how do we then reconcile uh, the two? Then three, how has globalization impacted on Africa, which has the most youthful population? Because we also need to position ourselves within the global arena and be able to get ways of managing the challenges that may be associated with that. And finally, there are contradictions that are associated with the different responses to youth challenges. For instance, in many of the African countries, you find that we had a problem of university education. Mm. It was as if university education is the alpha and omega to the youth problem. So governments went in and invested massively in putting up universities. Then they generated even a bigger number of informed and educated young people who are unemployed. And by sorting out one contradiction, we created another contradiction. You find that in some countries, even where they had, um, they, 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 they had the vocational institutions for purposes of imparting skills, those were also upgraded to full universities. And we created a huge army of young people, well informed, empowered, but who have less opportunities, and thereby creating even a bigger problem. How do we reconcile this? I beg to differ. Surely educated unemployed is not worse than uneducated unemployed. No, no, no. In, in the pro anyway. I no, no, no. What, 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 what I want to say, the problem on the part of government, it became now, you've ed because the young people, like, you've given us education, there are no jobs, because they are not skilled, like, going into private or create entrepreneurial spirit, creating their own, you find the governments are struggling to even encourage them to use that knowledge, to use that uh, empowerment. Mm. So to, to the government, it's okay. a big challenge. Mm. In all policy issues, you find we don't have jobs. We don't have jobs. And it is a major challenge around. Yeah, that's a, uh, it's from that economic. perspective. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, the ec economy has never been able to absorb the youth, educated or not. Um, one more at the back there. Thank you. Thank you, Wale. Um, you gave a very interesting analysis of youth um, and the way their marginality is being reduced, particularly their role in transformation, economic and political transformation. But from the point of view of Nigeria, I want to say that the socio-political power structure that keeps the youth you know, from participating in politics, particularly political leadership, is still intact. And again, if you look at the level of unemployment, particularly among graduates, given what happened about three months ago, where about uh, 550,000 applicants were, you know, asked to compete for 5,000 cities. And the analysis that you give in West Africa with reference to Nigeria, seems to, I mean, for me, it does not reconcile the aspect of this number of graduates who are, in, who are unemployed, who also constitutes, you know, vulnerability, particularly in terms of election and other involvement. So how do you reconcile your research finding in the context of Nigeria? Okay, all right, let's have our, our presenters um, a minute to respond each of you. Would you like to come up here or I think it was so you can be on the phone. Uh I would just give two comments on uh quick comments on uh two issues that came up. Uh first I want to talk uh, I want to say thank you very much uh inside. I think you energize the discussion in a way in which I think our post-lunch uh, <laughs> past was not able to do that. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, but two key uh, uh, areas where I want to comment very 
uh, quickly. First of all, in terms of the youth bargain its implication for Africa, uh, and what would a youthful society look like? Well, one thing that uh, definitely what a young Africa would look like or what a young Africa would produce is not the kind of Africa that older folks or people like us who are aging would want that society to look like or the society we look like. Uh, th what Africa is going to look like is going to be uh, uh, a continent uh, that comes uh, out of really this dynamic uh, dialogic interaction between the generations, old, new, uh, and very uh, young. And uh, as I pointed out in the paper, uh, the forces uh, that are helping to remake or helping shape the imagination uh, of this uh, young generation, some of them are old, but some of them are also uh, new. Uh, a, a lot of us in this room were not born into uh, the kind of mass communication and technological revolution that's affecting us. Uh, I was born into a country in which the country was never able to fully extend telephone communication, landline communication across the country. In fact, what the cellular revolution uh, led was the abandonment of that particular project. Very few landline Sierra Leone phones in Sierra Leone work. But what it made possible, especially for young people, what it made possible was this means in which not only within countries, but across uh, 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 countries and across the ocean can communicate almost instantly. Uh, this in, in itself has become sort of the patrimony of young people. Young people are far much more adept at using that technology uh, than uh, some of us older folks. And as you pointed out, in the case of the uh, Arab Spring, we see how that is shaping uh, uh, young people's imagination. I think it will take a time. Uh, this is a revolution that is relatively new. It's also a revolution that is fast moving and fast uh, uh, changing. Uh, so that's the first point that I uh, want to make. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point is really this discussion that you raised about education uh, and the sort of challenge that's facing uh, Africa and I sort of like your intervention. Uh, I mean, uh, to, 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 yeah, yeah. No, 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 but, uh, no, but I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but I think, I, I, I think that partly Wally was trying, uh, Wally raised that particular issue, and this is discussions that, that we've had in terms of thinking of the way in which uh, we conceptualize youth and the various differentiations that are among youth, and the fact that different kinds of youth face different kinds of challenges. Different kinds of youth bring different kinds of imaginations and different kinds of abilities into the process. Uh, one, of the, one of the discussions, in fact, in terms of thinking about youth uh, that we now have, youth is not only uh, 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 an issue sort of politics, youth as a political subject. Youth is a political category. One of the things that needs to change in this debate is the way we think about youth. Uh, I'm beginning to think that the definition of youth that we're using in West Africa in terms of government saying that youth fall within uh, uh, 15 to 35 has politics containing it. There's an element of it that infantilizes older young people. Uh, the second is, is an abdication, part of containing that is an ab abdication of the role of the state and so society to imagine a greater larger developmental project rather than playing to the kind of sec sectorial forms of development that uh, international agencies are pushing, but in which you have constituencies in various countries that have latched on into that. So youth in itself become part of uh, political categories in which all kinds of constituencies play into and uh, benefit. So I think that there's an element of youth for various governments and states that they have to reconceptualize as a labor problem. The United States does not have a youth problem for people who are uh, 18 and of working age. They have an un unemployment problem. Europeans don't have youth problems. They have an unemployment problem, which means that you are able to embed uh, the thinking and the planning for that particular category of people that we call youth within larger developmental and national strategies.
Thank you, Prof. Um, another is Marie. Um, I will just respond to two or three of the issues that have been raised. Thanks to, uh, to the discussion as well as those who have uh, offered comments and questions. The first one on the prospect of doing comparative uh, studies. Um, I think since we finished UVEX some um, five years ago, we've been angling to do, to replicate UVEX in other regions of, of, West, of Africa. But we haven't been too, uh, we have not been too successful uh, in, on that front, not because it is not needed, not because it is not important, but sometimes uh, we are at the mercy of where the funds are or when the funds become available in that respect. So it's something we have very much on the horizon, wherever and whenever the opportunity arises. And I think we are closest to do something in East Africa. Uh, on the two substantive issues, the first one on youth being used to pursue other people's agenda alongside their own in the context of youth wings of political parties. What I will say is that if you look at the trajectories of youth groups and youth movement, and how youth have been able to influence agenda, it never starts, or it has never started as a youth solely uh, initiative. Youth have always operated within the spaces or across or in, in relation to other coalitions. Uh, for your interest, Boko Haram started as part of you know, youth being, being used for election purposes by politicians in the northeast region of Nigeria. And that is how all armed groups and militia groups in Nigeria have always emerged. But what happens is that after a while, once the youth are able to gain traction and they are able to cement the power base, they begin to exercise their agencies. They begin to set the agenda. They begin to put conditions down on the table for you know, uh, adult uh, uh, politicians or uh, power elites. And this is where the problem then starts, because the elite now wants to crush them, and the, the youth have to resist. And that is where you always have insurgency. And that is the beginning, you know, that is the long and short story of Boko Haram for you. And it, Boko Haram is not different from many other militia and armed groups. So what does this tell us? Young people are very smart. Yes, you can use them. They make themselves available to be used, but they know what they are doing. At the right time, at the right moment, they turn. And they begin to seize the moment. They seize, you know, they seize the space. And they transform that position, that they are below position, into positions of authority, into positions whereby they are able to dictate the terms of politics, the terms of policy, and the terms of governance in society. So it is not unusual that you find youth in those kind of situations or instances. They will be your, you know, your political talks. They will be your whatever it is, your area boys. You will use them for your needs. But as you are using them, they are creating spaces for themselves. They are understanding how that network operates. They are understanding the power dynamics at play. And they are understanding where the real power lies. And the moment they smell or they occupy that space or they, under, uh, uh, they seize that moment, then you begin to see their agency. So it is a, no, it is a natural way you know, that you find you uh, operating. The second substantive issue is on the, which one uh, that was raised in relation to Nigeria, how the recruitment and the death that happened in the light of recruitment to the immigration service in Nigeria, how that contradict my uh, presentation. I don't think there is a contradiction per se. Because what you find, I have not, I mean, my presentation does not deny the fact that you have young people who are unemployed or who are looking for employment or who are underemployed. But the first thing to note is that it is not all those 500 and something thousand young people that went for that aptitude test that are jobless. They are, you know, when people talk about being employed or not being employed, it's different from livelihood activities. If you dig further down, you will find that they have one or two livelihood activities. And when you, you look at the cosmology of young people in terms of their economic engagement, you will see that they are engaged in multiple livelihood activities at the same time. Mm -hmm. One moment, they are selling recharge card. The next moment, they are operating Okada. The next moment, they are security guards. The next moment, they are political talks. The next moment, you know, they are <laughs> the partitioning or the role of education in the kind of livelihood activities and choices young people make is fast changing because you're going to find educated university graduates being part of militia groups. You're going to find them driving Okadas. 
you're going to you know find them you know being barbers and you know getting engaged in a variety of activities so that is the reality of what is happening in the informal sphere young people are not waiting and they are not never going to wait to get jobs in, you know in the formal sphere they are finding alternatives thank you thank you let me thank both our panelists and our discussant, Mishai, for, for a very good job. And if I may indulge, this conversation reminded me of an incident that happened outside Kaduna in the 1980s when Ibrahim Babangida, the then president, went to a large village outside Kaduna after several years of universal health care. And as the team arrived in the village, kids swarmed, you know how it is when you go, swarmed from every direction out of every nook, cranny and crevice and Ibrahim Babangida then looked at his minister and says, hey oh Aki, you see the problem you have created so the question is, should he withdraw health care? So with education, it's ironic to me that Boko Haram is campaigning against Western education when they come from that region of Nigeria which has had the least access and the highest illiteracies, specifically extremely gendered high illiteracies. So it's the youth who are not given access to education or decent education that are now condemning Western education. And I'll end with that old proverb. There's an old proverb. If the young are not initiated into the village, they will burn it down. Thank you. Thank you.